Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Parsons, and I'm the Events and Communications Director at Ocean Energy Europe. Um, I'm here to welcome you to this side event of the OE 2021 conference, which, as some of you will know, took place in Brussels on Monday and Tuesday. Um, we also have a set of side events taking place online today. Um, and this is our final one. So I'd like to take the opportunity as we're at the end of the conference now to thank everybody who came to the event um, and everybody who's online today um, to join for the, the side events. So just a quick word about this webinar. Um, it's been organized by the NEMO project, which is a, a project working on the design of tidal turbine blades. Um, we actually had a very interesting session on blade technology in the program yesterday, and we did present a, a summary of the, the NEMO project team's activities. Um, but this, this webinar is designed to be a bit more of a deep dive into the latest results from the project um, across all the different disciplines that are involved. Um, the overall aim of the project is to improve the design and materials of tidal turbine blades um, that should then bring down the cost of the project and increase the, the turbine yield, um, both of which are obviously very important for commercialising tidal energy as, as a whole. Um, so the, the session is going to be moderated by Pablo Benguria, who's the, the project coordinator from Technalia. Um, so he's going to explain a little bit more about you know, the NEMO project um, and the activities and the aims and so on. Um, and then he'll be, yeah, be moderating the, the presentations that are to follow. So Pablo, I'll, I'll pass over to you. And thanks again, everybody, for, for joining us today. OK, thank you, Amy. Um, I'm trying to, well, uh, I'm trying to share my screen, maybe. Uh, yeah, here I am. Well, as, as Amy said, I'm the project coordinator of uh, NEMA project. Uh, I'm, I'm project manager, man, management, uh, my manager in, in technology research and innovation and research technological center in, in Spain. And uh, well, uh, NEMA project, uh, the, the main objective of, of the of the I will, I will briefly explain to you the, the objectives and and the main more packages and, and activities in the NEMA project because. Then my colleagues will will go into the detail on, on each of them. So the the the, the wider or the, the main uh, objective of the of the of normal project is making blades uh, cheaper, making tidal, sorry, making tidal energy cheaper by means of reducing the cost of uh, on of, of blades and increasing their production up to uh, zero point fifteen uh, euros per kilo, kilowatt uh, hour. According to the to the meeting to the targets of uh, 20, 25 set uh, so Nemo is about plates uh, that is uh, quite clear. Uh, in the project, we uh, design an holistic approach uh, in which uh, we are uh, um, uh, uh, focus on on, on several uh, uh, items. The first one is the simulation techniques. For, for for simulating which kind of uh, improvements can we make to the to the to the blades, uh, we of course need data from from large scale of uh, offshore demonstrations demonstrators. That's why we have a, an end user on board. Uh, we will design novel testing procedures to to replicate the the real stresses occurring in the blades. Uh, we will uh, we are currently. Uh, uh, investigating research in, uh, to increase the, the mechanical hydrodynamic aging and falling performance of, of the blade. Uh, we, we are performing as well an extensive testing campaign, including those novel testing procedures to develop uh, models that predict uh, better the, the, the behavior of the composite of the composite of the blades. Uh, we will. Uh, we are uh, uh, designing innovative methodologies to design uh, optimized composite plates, and at the end, we will test and validate all of these uh, uh, developments on TRL uh, five on the on the Nemo uh, uh, device, which you can see in the in the in the picture. Uh, the main uh, scientific and technological objectives are uh, novel blade designs uh, by means of active flow controls, materials, and novel surfaces as well. Um, new nano uh, composites, not only the, the, the surface as the previous valid point, but also the composites that are inside the blades to uh, reduce the failures and increase the lifespan of the, of the blades. 
a model design and test the life and resistance of the of the new composite that we will design in the, in the previous point. Uh, and all of this will contribute to, to some economic objecti objectives that as the, the as I said, the, the main objective of, of the project of reducing by 70% the LCOE in tidal energy by 50% uh, capex reduction and by means of lower material consumption and a lower cost of, of new composites, a little increase in the fixed uh, charge rate by means of uh, obtaining a higher 66% uh, uh, higher li lifespan, reducing by 40% the, the operational maintenance uh, cost by means of reducing the cavitation wear by a falling and aging of the blades, and a 20% increase in, increase in an annual energy production. All these um, previous measures will, will, will uh, conduct to this uh, uh, increase of, of annual energy production. Well, the, the consortium itself is, is, is formed by, by two industrial partners, Espinano and Impre, uh, while they're both uh, um, SMEs. Uh, we have eight uh, research and, and developer partners uh, on board who are providing different uh, edge and leading edge technology advances. And, uh, and the large global network of ocean energy professionals, Thanks to them, we are all, we are all here today. And as I said, a final and end user, Magallanes uh, Renewables, uh, who owns the, the the device in which the the, the result of the project, the, the prototype, the full scale prototype, uh, will be tested at the end of the project. Okay, this is the configuration of the project. We have three main uh, work packages at the beginning. Uh, who are running uh, in, in parallel. Uh, the first one dedicated to uh, simulation uh, technologies, uh, the second one to active flow control design and testing, and the third one uh, dedicated to uh, surfaces, nano reinforced compost surfaces and composites uh, to, to increase the, the, the performance of the blades. Then we have a, a work package four uh, devoted to uh, testing campaigns. Or, or package five to innovative and analysis models and, and testing and, and design procedures, and then a transversal cross-cutting uh, activities uh, devoted to LCA and, and uh, socio and economic uh, analysis of, of the technologies and a seven and work package seven exploitation, dissemination, and communication. Okay, from a business, a business uh, perspective, the results uh, will be the, the simulation and composite light design services. For those partners that are working on, on, on mainly on the work on one and, and, and five, sorry, uh, the testing of tidal composite blades, uh, blades uh, new, new procedures for, for testing the, the blades. Uh, we will obtain as well some products, new products, such as the new novel composites for, for tidal blades. Uh, a new design for, for tidal generation as well, novel coatings uh, with uh, enhanced properties of uh, anti fouling uh, uh, properties. Sorry. Uh, okay, this is the scan and the expected results uh, by the end of the project that is ending uh, late next year. Uh, we will have validated all these technologies by a year uh, four to five. Actually, it's is a real uh, full-scale uh, uh, testing, as I said. Um, uh, this will allow the development and testing of uh, full-scale of, of uh, tidal turbines, plates, and, and test rigs. The validation of models and novel designs. The evaluation of novel of new composite material performance at real scale. The demonstration uh, uh, full-scale that will cost around 15 million is not included. Uh, in the, in the project, it will be it will take place after the end of the project, uh, and by 2025 uh, we expect to achieve the objective of uh, 15 uh, cents of euro per kilowatts in, in energy tidal cost. So that that is in a nutshell uh, what its Nemo uh, project about. Uh, and I will leave and I will uh, let the, the, the floor to to my colleagues to to explain. In depth, uh, some of the of the uh, developments that we are uh, having in, in on board. Okay, so 
I went pretty quick. Um, I think that the first one is uh, Chandra. Yes. Okay, Chandra, Chandra is uh, working for, for Technion and, and at the Technological Institute in, in Israel. Um, and he is leading the World Package number one. So he will explain what uh, they did, uh, what uh, Memo Consortium did in this World Package. Thank you, Pablo. So I'm Chansha Garpan from Technion and welcome to the Ocean Engineering EU conference. So today I'll be presenting the CFD for simulating tidal turbine cavitation. So this is the overall definition of the problem in which two tidal turbines are there and the upstream and the downstream. So these turbines are having the inlet velocity through the tidal waves and these are propelling the whole ship. The first turbine and the second turbine are the middle images. And basically to get the feel that how big these are, these are like 19.5 meter diameter is the like the, to, the diameter of the turbine. And since water is a working fluid, so you may expect that the problem of cavitation is there. So to give a brief introduction of the cavitation is, the cavitation is a phenomena in which the formation of the bubbles, formation of the bubbles are there over the blades. And because of these bubbles, these may like burst and correspondingly the efficiency of the blades will detonate. Now coming again to the point that the length scale and the velocity field, as you would expect that since the length scale is about 19.5 meter and the inlet velocity is 2.5 meter. So overall Reynolds number will be very high. So what gives the idea that the flow will be in the turbulent regime. So as you would expect that turbulent is basically the chaotic behavior. And to give the glimpses that what is the turbulent behavior, this Heisenberg who won the Nobel Prize in 1932, he said that when he will die, he will ask the God that why turbulence and why related. And he further said that God will obviously give me the answer for the why the second one, but I'm not sure about the first one, why turbulence. So beginning with this, flow behavior with the turbulent characteristic, like scientists, engineers always used to model this behavior by using different models. The brief, like this is given in this figure, the very crude way of defining this uh, turbulent behavior is the Rand's characteristic in which we are dealing with the average flow. And as you expect that since we are only dealing with the average field, therefore we does not get the unsteadiness of the flow and correspondingly the computational power will be very less. But if we had to track all those features of the flow in which unsteady flow is, unsteady flow characteristic of the flow will be there, then we had to increase our computational power and then we can move into the LES or the large eddy simulations in which we are focusing on the large scale or the large flow structures of the flow and we are modeling the smallest structures. As you can see in this figure that we are able to trace the unsteady characteristic of the flow, but moving more on the computational power where we have the direct numerical simulations in which we are modeling nothing. We are exactly replicating the experimental results through solving all the scales, like the larger scale, smaller scale, as, as well as the temporal scale. So as you would expect that the computational power will increase. So intermediate step or the inter intermediate modeling approach with the large edge simulations or the LES. So in this work, we will be using the computational power, the computational tool, which is known as the large eddy simulations. Now this was related to the CFD or the general characteristic that what will be using as a CFD tool, the large eddy simulation. But what will happen to our flow, what will happen to our tidal turbine? Like we have the 19.5 meter diameter turbine. And if we had to simulate this, then to give glimpses that how difficult it is. It is a rotating geometry in which, <clears throat> in which like we had to, you had to classify the flow as the turbulent nature and on, on the top of it, you have the rotating board. So it is very intricate. In fact, to give the idea 
the how difficult it is in terms of their computational power. Liu et al. in 2016 demonstrated that it requires at least 1024 processors running in a week to get the RANS results. So it is like computationally prohibited to get more idea of the flow, like the unsteady characteristic through using the large ready simulation. So this is computationally prohibited to actually simulate the whole turbine. So what is the next step is that scientists have found out that the another modeling approach, which can be used to demonstrate the, this rotating characteristic of the turbine through the ALM method, not the actuator line method, in which instead of using the whole turbine or the whole blade, we are modeling the each blade as an actuator line. Actuator line is comprises of different, different actuator points in which we are having the details of these points in terms of the coefficient of lift and the coefficient of power. So this is a modeling approach for dealing with the rotating turbine. But what happened to the computational expenses? So in 2016, Virtual find out that it decreases the computational power by fourth order as far as this computational power is concerned. Or what is happening to the accuracy? Dealing with the accuracy in like NT and you had demonstrated like come up with the experimental result and they have given an open challenge to all the modeling community that please come and validate the experimental data from uh, some like compare the experimental data whatever they had got from your modeling approach. And they have documented in the paper that from the current comparison from all the models, it seems that the large edit simulation coupled with the actuator line method is the best approach for dealing with these kind of rotating geometries. <clears throat> and coming to our actual problem in which we are dealing with the Magellanus blade. So to have this actuator line method over this, we had to take the blade. This is the procedure that we generally follow. We take the blade, we slice it, and that each, each slice, we were trying to find out the coefficient of lift and the coefficient of drag. So these coefficient of lift and drag can fed into as a form of tabular form in the navier stoke equation where it acts as a source. Term. Then accordingly, these have an effect on the navier stoke equation there we will get the forces correspondingly to this, to this hydrofoil at different sections. So this, these CL and CD curves we are getting from the open source software, which is known as the Cubelet simulation. So this is the video that we generated using this actuator line method simulating through open foam. As you can see that the upstream turbine is rotating in the clockwise direction, while the downstream turbine is rotating in the anti-clockwise direction. And there is an interaction because of the wakes produced from the upstream turbine. As you can see that the flow field that has been experienced from the upstream turbine is not same as that of the downstream turbine. And there is some interaction going on. Since the distance between the upstream turbine and the downstream turbine is approximately one diameter, which is 19.5 meter. So there is indeed effect of first turbine and the second turbine. To have more closer look into it, I took the slice over it. As you can see that the, the whatever the flow field experienced by the turbine one or the upstream turbine, is not exactly the same as that is being experienced by the turbine two or the downstream turbine. And consequently, because of this difference in the inflow characteristic, the output that these two turbines are being producing is not the same. And consequently, there will be a power disbalance and thereby there will be a vibrations. So what is there? So what can we do in this regard? So essentially, the Magellanus have a setup through which they can change the pitch angle. Through pitch angle, what we generally meant is that we are changing the angle of attack through which each blade is looking or each or each blade is referring to. So by changing the angle of attack, is we have done a bunch of simulation through which we are changing the external pitch. And consequently, we have observed that if you are changing the angle of attack for the upstream turbine, the coefficient of power for the upstream turbine will decrease. And what will be the effect on the downstream turbine? is that this downstream turbine will look, will see the more uniform kind of wave. And consequently, at some point, the inflow characteristic for the upstream turbine and the downstream turbine will be comparable. And consequently, we can observe, we can expect that the power output from the first turbine and the second turbine will be somehow equal. And consequently, we will have a more 
like more uniform power and the thereby reduce vibration so this was the kind of exercise that we have done as far as this the two turbine setup is, is concerned now like coming to the problem of cavitation and cavitation control so we have looked at this so our present work was motivated by the experimental work of timoshenko in 2018 where he took a slice of the francis turbine and at 0.6 times of the power line he introduced a slot through this slot they introduce a jet through which they were seeing that what will be the impact of cavitation on this as you can see in this video there is for this inlet velocity and the cavitation number is 0.3 0.93 there is unsteady cavitation and you can see that the bubbles are being formed but eventually if we like after some time if we switch on this blowing at 0.6 uh, chord length as you can see in this snapshot that because of this blowing you can see that all the cavitation or the bubble formation has been retarded or there is mitigation of the cavitation but is it true that if we increase if we keep on increasing this uh, blowing velocity what will be the impact on cavitation or what will happen to this bubble formation you can see by increasing further increasing this uh, wall jet injection again this cavitation comes or the formation of the bubble comes so there is some kind of limit or we had to limit this wall injection this is not always correct that wherever we inject the, this blowing it will mitigate the cavitation so look to look properly into this problem we carried out the numerical simulation for the similar setup and we also found out that similar kind of strategies similar kind of characteristics are there like if we go on from time 0 to 0.2 then the cavitation is there further if we are having very high blowing rate as we have observed in the experimental work then there is cavitation but what is happening if we decrease the this blowing rate then we can see that we were able to mitigate this kind of cavitation so this was related to angle of attack of zero focus of the 3 degree but is it true for the higher angle of attack to demonstrate this we have uh, carried out the large eddy simulation for the similar setup and firstly we found out like what is how this cavitation phenomena is happening and how this uh, this detach or the cav cavity of uh, cavity of the cavitation is being detached from the hydrofoil so to investigate this we found out that there is a phenomena which is known as reentry jet so this is not a very new phenomena that that we found out that we found out this this is already being reported in the literature but we found out that this is indeed a particular thing that we have to always notice that there is some kind of reentry jet which is produced because of the decrease in pressure and consequently when it reaches at the leading edge it detaches the whole uh, cavity and consequently this process goes on whenever it reaches at the tip it detaches the cavity and again the formation of the cavity happens now what is happening if you are introducing this kind of wall jet injection at the slot surprisingly we found out that whatever variation we do with the injection velocity we found that the similar kind of characteristics are there like this similar kind of cavity is being formed regardless of whatever the blowing rate we are observing so this was a quite surprising that the similar for the case of lower angle of attack this does not happen like we have observed that for the lower wall injection there is mitigation of the cavitation and as we increase this blowing rate the cavitation comes but for this case for the higher angle of attack we observed that nothing is happening and it is exactly the similar as if we are nothing blowing we are not not blowing anything and the simple cavitation is happening so we found out there is indeed a mechanism which we found out that there is an interaction of reentrant jet and the wall jet which we are introducing and because of this recirculation is formed and again because of this there are higher fluctuations pressure fluctuation and which are basically contradicting whatever the positive effect has been observed or whatever the positive effect the wall jet was doing. so finally concluding we found out that for the lower angle of attack this wall jet injection could be used but there is a there is a like payment you have to pay for like the hydrodynamic performance of the hydrofoil will decrease because the coefficient of lift and the coefficient of pressure will decrease but for the higher angle of attack it is not a good way by using the wall jet injection regardless of the wall jet injection wall jet velocity that we are using thus finally the wall jet 
for the cavitation control should be used this caution that's all from our side thank you Thank you, Chandra. Um, I don't know if there is uh, any question over there, around there. Uh, if not, uh, let's move to the next speaker. It's uh, Michael Lear Anderson from uh, SSPA. Um, SSPA is a, a Swedish uh, company. is uh, leading the, the work package number two. And he's talking about uh, cavitation tunnel testing for, for tidal blades uh, design. So, Michael, Michael, whenever you want. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you stop? Thank you. We are, you, you have your cameras uh, closed. I do. Want to... uh, yeah, one second. Uh, Working on it. <laughs> Presentation is not in in full screen. Uh, yeah, you want to. No, it's okay. We now. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, yes, as uh, Pablo said, uh, I will talk about uh, cavitation tunnel testing at SSPA, uh, which is uh, at least for the start of the project, the uh, beginning of the project, uh, placed in wood package two mainly uh, that there are other aspects of Wood 2, which, which I will not go into. I, I, I will only talk about the cavitation tunnel uh, testing at the SSPA. Uh, so here you have uh, yeah, a picture of our cavitation tunnel. It's, it's, it's one of uh, three major um, facilities we have at SSPA. We also have a towing tank and a marine dynamics laboratory. Uh, so so I, I would like to start by um, uh, stopping any confusion about the name cavitation tunnel testing. It, it, uh, many, many people think that it's, it's all about cavitation and, and that's not entirely true. Um, it's also about uh, performance testing of, of the um, Magellan's uh, plates. Uh, so what, what we can do in the cavitation tunnel, of course, is to, to create a uniform flow around the uh, plates. Um, and uh, also uh, control the, the pressure in the cavitation tunnel, which is more related to actual cavitation testing. Uh, in, in NEMO, we uh, have been testing uh, two types of uh, uh, models, so to say, uh, of the Magellan's turbine. Uh, one is uh, a constant cross-section profile, and, and the other is a uh, rotating turbine. Uh, and I'll start with saying a few words about the constant cross-section profile. Um, the reason for testing uh, the constant cross-section profile is that the uh, uh, scale or, or, or the uh, scale we can build the model in is uh, much larger than the uh, rotating turbine. Uh, in fact, the, the rotating turbine is scale 1 to 38 and, and the um, constant cross-section profile is um, uh, 1 to 7. Uh, which gives us two advantages. One, one is we have a larger Reynolds number, and, and the other is that um, the, the, the um, uh, cross-sectional profile is, is much larger, of course, than, than the rotating turbine, which allows us to, to do more um, testing of, for example, active flow control um, uh, on, on the constant cross-sectional profiles than the rotating turbine. Um, this is a um, picture of how it works, works on the left side. We, we, we built two constant cross-sectional profiles, one at a radius of 0 0.5 uh, of the um, uh, radius of, of the um, uh, uh, blades and another at 0 0.8 uh, uh, of the radius. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 um, the profiles we built are so-called unrolled uh, profiles. So if you imagine, for example, at, at the 0 0.5 um, radius, uh, we, uh, the, the turbine will be uh, rotating and, and, and the flow direction will, will, will not be 
if, if, if you cut it, it, it would be um, a, a circular cut and, and then it's unrolled to, to uh, create a constant cross-sectional profile. Uh, and, and what we measure in, in these tests uh, are, are um, uh, lift and uh, drag and, 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 and also the, the yawing uh, moment, which is not very interesting for, for these tests. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as I said, one, one of the reasons why we, we uh, use this constant cross-section profile, it's, it's um, uh, mainly because of, of the scale, as I said, so, so we can actually test um, uh, active and passive flow control. Uh, and here you have one example of passive flow control with uh, Vortex generators um, uh, uh, included to uh, delay separation, as, as uh, has been seen many times in, in the literature for, for um, uh, wind turbines. So it's the same principle. Uh, the other one uh, yeah. is the uh, blowing, uh, which uh, Shantra talked about in, in the CFD simulations. Uh, what you see here is, is the large cross-sectional profile uh, where we um, uh, made a cavity uh, and uh, we are uh, blowing uh, water in, inside the, the cavity. Uh, uh, through a, a what, what you can't see uh, is that, uh, uh, of course, this is only the cavity that, that, that that's a top plate. Well, actually, you can see the top plate here in, in, in the top of the picture, uh, which creates a, a small slit um, in the uh, profile where, where water is blown uh, through. Uh, and, and, and the black part in, in the middle here is uh, guide wanes to, to ensure that. Or, or at least uh, improve that that um, the uh, flow is aligned with the uh, free stream uh, direction of the flow. Uh, oops, that was wrong way. One more. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> then I'll I'll move on to. Um, uh, the uh, actual uh, turbine tests. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, is, is completed in a scale of 1 to 39. Uh, so it's, it's much uh, a smaller scale than, than the constant cross-sectional profiles. Uh, the reason for that, uh, perhaps you can see in, in the picture to the right, that, that, that the blades uh, is, is uh, not very big com compared to the cross-sectional cross -section, cross area of, of the um, inside of the cavitation tunnel. Uh, but we, we need to have a quite wide margin uh, to, to not create uh, a too big um, uh, blockage uh, effects. Uh, the, the, the model is, is made to um, be able to um, uh, uh, modify the pitch of, of the blades uh, to plus minus 20 degrees. Uh, the uh, uh, RPS in, in model scale is uh, 8 to 15 and with a constant flow speed of two and a half meters per second. The, the, the um, important parameter here is, is the uh, advanced ratio, which should be the same as, as the full scale model. And, and we vary uh, that by changing the RPS, not, not the flow speed. <coughs> um, uh, the the, the cell uh, of, of kind of the, the torpedo under, under the Magellan's um, device is, is uh, modeled to be uh, the, the same geometry in the model test. Uh, and what you can also see here is that the uh, the yaw angle uh, of of the turbine is is not aligned to to, to the free stream direction. Uh, in, in this picture, of, of course, we tested that too. But uh, the the Magellan's um, turbine is a little bit special in in the way that uh, it's designed to be be able to handle or, or even perhaps uh, improve performance with, with a yaw angle compared to the uh, tidal uh, free stream direction. Uh, so what we, we measure in these tests test are torque and, and thrust uh, and, and of course uh, uh, RPS. Um, and uh, yeah, the, 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 this is a picture of, of the design of, of, of the um, of the setup. Uh, what you can see on, on the left side, uh, is that the, we have a turntable, um, so so we can uh, change the uh, yaw direction. The, the pitch control is uh, uh, actual, uh, actually manual, 
uh, so we have to go in manually and, and, and change that uh, the uh, um, the hub is so small that it was difficult to build automatic uh, pitch control but but what you can also see from this picture is that the uh, the blades are, are interchangeable um so uh, we can use the same setup with uh, different uh, types of blades or different designs of blades and and also now we we have tested uh, well two two di two geometries and and one of the geometries with um, carbon fiber blade and and uh, bronze blades uh, um, made at SSPA uh, so the, the, this gives you a gives you an idea of the dimension of, of the um, cavitation tunnel test. Uh, the the uh, cavitation tunnel the, the, we actually have different sections we can use, but but for the rotating turbine blade we use the biggest uh, section, which has a height of one and a half meter and, and a width of two point six meters. Um, and what what I would like to say about this slide also is that you 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 can see um, kind of holes in, in in the bottom of of the um, cavitation tunnels. Uh, it's it's obviously not holes. It's it's uh, windows um, which we use to um, uh, uh, do uh, LDV measurements. Uh, so so we shoot the laser through these um, uh, windows. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of how that looks in a in a minute. Uh, so the uh, obviously we, we we have tested, uh, well maybe not obviously, but but we 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 have tested four different uh, pitch angles and four different uh, yaw angles uh, at at the entire range uh, before and and also some distance after um, stall angle. Uh, and what you can see here is, is two different. Uh, well, the, the 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 blue curves is is the CP uh, coefficient of power, and the green ones are uh, CT. Uh, so so the thrust uh, coefficient, which, which is not terribly interesting for 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 the Magellan's turbine. Uh, of course, CP is much more important. Uh, but 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 what you can also see is that that, that there are some it's it's um, the the light blue and the and the dark blue colors uh, refer to different uh, tunnel pressures. Uh, so the the um, uh, dark blue is closer to, to atmospheric pressure, but 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 the Magellan's turbine uh, operates uh, at at a depth where where the um, uh, uh, light blue is 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 more in in, in alignment with uh, the uh, hydrostatic pressure that that the turbine is operating under, and what you can see is that spe especially after stall, um, uh, that there, there, there are some discrepancy between these, which indicate uh, some not not terribly high, but some cavitation at least. Uh, so we also tested um, LDV measurements, as I said, the, uh, that's short for laser Doppler velocimetry, velocimetry it's called. <laughs> uh, and, and as I said, we, we uh, shoot the lasers um, through the windows uh, in the bottom of the cavitation tunnel. Um, uh, and why do we do that? You might ask. But the the, the, the reason is one of the reasons is that uh, we 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 are only testing uh, the the uh, upstream um, turbine blades, not not the downstream. It, it was simply too difficult to build. Um, so to 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 get an idea of of the um, wake that the um, blades uh, create to, to the downstream blades, we, 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 we measure that with um, laser Doppler or LDV. And so, so you can see here, we, we have one plane we measure just behind the blade, we have one um, uh, plane we measure um, at the position of the downstream uh, blades, uh, and we all actually also have one uh, just upstream of the blades, which, which is not shown in this picture. Uh, so finally, uh, couldn't really uh, talk about this without showing you how it actually looks. Um, so here you can see the um, the turbine blade uh, actually rotating, uh, and and you can also see the uh, the lasers uh, uh, measuring in the aft position uh, 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 of, or the aft blade position.
Okay, that was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Okay, thank you, Michael. If there is any question, you can write down them in the in the chat or just uh, raise your hand. Okay, if no questions are there, uh, let's go for the next speaker. Is uh, Celia Mercader from Canoe, Adela. Um, she is leading the work package number three about uh, composites, mainly about composites and, 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 and coatings so, uh, as well. But uh, Thelia's group are uh, taking the lead of uh, designing or increasing uh, the, uh, the, the strength of the blades by including uh, carbon nanoparticles in the, in the composite formulation. So she will explain how, how it works. Go ahead. Thanks, Pablo. So I will present you the, the work we have done. It consists on uh, increasing the, the blade uh, strength by means of addition of uh, nanoparticles inside the composite uh, formulation. So this work was done in the framework of uh, World Package 3. It was done in a uh, canoe platform in uh, France in, um, in collaboration also with um, SP Nano in, uh, in Israel. So the idea is to improve the, um, the mechanical properties of the, um, of the blade. We want to enhance the, the fatigue and also the impact uh, resistance. So the idea is to use nanoparticles to reinforce the, the resin, the, the composite uh, materials. So the blend is made of the resin, which is a vinyl ester resin. It, um, we didn't uh, change the, the initially used resin. And uh, inside the, this, uh, this resin, we put some, um, some glass, uh, glass fiber fabrics. <clears throat> The, the strategy we use is to disperse some uh, nanoparticles inside the resin before manufacturing the, the composite blades. We different fillers on the different concentration of fillers were tested and uh, selected. We, we are working with uh, carbon nanotubes and also with um, Copo block, copolymer, copolymer block impact modifier. We, we need the, 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 the key is to have um, an homogeneous and stable dispersion of these uh, particles inside the, the liquid resin in order to, to reinforce the, the matrix against cohesive failure. For this, we use different uh, high shear mixing uh, tools. For example, as you can see on the picture here, um, what we call a three wall uh, mills, where we have um, a high shearing between uh, two walls, which, um, which lead to a, to a good dispersion of the particles inside the, inside the resin uh, matrix. And we were also using some uh, twin crew extruder without uh, heating called the twin crew extruder in order to perform the dispersion of the particles at high uh, concentration level before um, doing some conventional uh, dilution by, uh, by steering. So concerning the carbon nanotubes, we use commercial uh, reference. It's in form of uh, pre-dispersion. It's uh, like this, pellets, uh, concentration of uh, 25 uh, weight percent of CNT inside a matrix. And we, we have to disperse these pellets inside the, the, the resin of the NEMO project. So here using the three wall mills, and then we, we selected um, a concentration, for example, here of 2.5% uh, of nanotubes inside the resin. Then to obtain the composite blades, before we were, we were working with uh, composite plates in order to, to do the evaluation of the different uh, particles and concentration we, uh, we use. And the, um, the process we use to manufacture this uh, composite uh, plate is uh, liquid infusion. 
so it's uh, very conventional to make um, to make wind blade or also uh, here tile blade. So the idea is um, on a, on the marble you pull you, you put your your different uh, plies of um, of fabrics. So in this case of glass glass fiber fiber fabrics, then you. You, you put this uh, this tissue which is very conventional for for infusion you you put everything under under vacuum and uh, the resin is uh, is growing through the different uh, fabrics then you do a post curing of the um, of the of the of the resin and you obtain your your composite uh, plate for each filler and for each concentration we, we studied, we, we, we made four plates for making all the mechanical uh, characterization. Since the beginning of the project, 17 formulation were mechani mechanically uh, characterized. We will show you today uh, some of the main uh, results. So the first characterization we do is um, the mechanical tra traction with fibers at zero degrees and also with fibers at 90 degrees. What we observe is that both modulus and the maximum stress are, are not influenced by the presence of our nanoparticles. It's mainly uh, driven by the, by the matrix. So on this characteristic, no really improvement. Then we also do some uh, traction with the fiber uh, are at uh, plus or minus 45 degrees. <clears throat> what, we, what we observe is that with um, impact modifier at 2.5 weight percent inside the, the resin, and also with carbon nanotubes at 0.1 or even 0.5 weight percent inside the resin, we, uh, we have an increase of, uh, of both young modulus and also uh, maximum uh, stress. So this is um, a good result. We were expecting a, a better increase, but um, okay, at least we, we can observe um, an enhancement of uh, these uh, properties. Then we also perform some uh, interlaminar shear stress uh, measurement. And uh, also in, uh, in that case, we can observe compared to the reference, this means the resin without any um, additive, an improvement of 25% uh, uh, of the ELSS for the formulation containing 2.5% of impact modifier and 0.5% uh, of uh, carbon nanotubes. Concerning the um, what we want, because of this uh, result, we were thinking maybe if we mix the carbon nanotubes and the impact modifier together in the same formulation, we will uh, we will see a synergetic effect and uh, improve uh, mechanical uh, properties. So this is what we what we made. We made uh, again five new formulations combining these two uh, these two um, nano nano uh, nanoparticles, but um, no real uh, improvement can be uh, can be seen. <laughs> And the same for impact uh, impact strengths compared to the to the reference, the the, the addition of nanoparticles uh, doesn't affect this um, this uh, these properties. So as a conclusion, we can improve ELSS on traction in um, in plus or minus uh, forty five degrees compared to the sense of the um, of the fibers. So based on this result, we selected two formulations, the one with 0.5 carbon nanotubes and the one with 2.5 impact uh, modifiers dispersed inside the resin. Based on this uh, result, we, we made, uh, um, let's say 500 kilograms of this uh, formulated uh, resin, two batch, one, one with the nanotubes, one with the impact modifiers. And it was delivered to, um, to Impre, which is uh, Nemo Partners in charge of the, of the manufacturing of the blade at, um, at full scale. 
and uh, here you can see some uh, some picture of the infusion of um, half of the blade using the impact uh, modifier. It was a, a really good result because it was an upscale from um, from plates to uh, directly the full scale blade. And uh, what we can observe is that we have no node Y zone. This means all the resin um, goes through the, all the glass fabrics, and we don't have any filtration of the of the impact uh, modifier. And here you can see the. Um, the formulated uh, blade that will be uh, that will be installed and uh, and test in uh, in will see condition um, in uh, in in um, in few weeks. The same works was done with the formulation containing uh, carbon nanotubes, but it was um, it was not as good as with the impact modifiers. The the viscosity of the formulated uh, resin was um, a little a bit too high and we add quite a lot of uh, of filtration of the fillers through the um, the different glass uh, fabrics so at the end the the half blade that was made using the carbon nanotubes is not um, is not good for um, for wheel uh, tasting but okay we have uh, we have this one with the impact modifiers and we can, we we will be able to do some comparison with the reference materials without any um, any additives thanks for your attention thank you celia um no questions are over there so uh, maybe we can move to the next speaker. We have now a couple of speakers about uh, anti fouling solutions. First of, of, of them is, is Claude Richards uh, from DCU and uh, Irish uh, University, uh, who has been working in, in, in the World Package 3, uh, mainly in designing biomimetic texturing as an effective anti fouling solution. Uh, it's quite interesting. Then, then we will, uh, well, then we will have a, a more traditional anti-fouling coatings uh, solution. But let's go to 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 Chloe's. Uh, Chloe, your floor is yours. Yep. Let's put it in full view. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Chloe Richards. I am a final year PhD student in the School of Chemical Sciences in DCU. Um, so my PhD research then centers around the problem of biofouling in the marine environment, with an emphasis then on developing a natural solution to the fouling problem. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of the characterization, replication and testing of our design microtextures as part of work package three, um, inspired by the marine brill fish. This is just first slide gives us just an outline of some of the key talking points for the presentation. Um, so first of all, I suppose the main reason we're here is fouling, the problem of fouling in the marine environment. So fouling involves the accumulation of unwanted material on the surface. Um, the material can be either comprised of organic or inorganic compounds or fouling organisms ranging in size from individual bacteria to marine barnacles. This can produce complex multidimensional and multi-species multi communities. It usually begins then with when the surface is submerged in water. So the process begins with the absorption of organic molecules, such as proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids. And this essentially aids in the adhesion of fouling organisms to the surface, kind of providing a conditioning layer. Um, it occurs just after the surface is submerged in the water and allows for the favorable attachment of biofouling organisms. So the attachment step then follows um, where the cells attach with these and um, the growth the growth step follows after that, uh, cells grow and proliferate. And then the last stage then would be the detachment stage where, you know, part of the bacterial biofilm will actually detach from the surface. And this may occur as a result of the overdevelopment of a biofilm layer or the layer actually losing its mechanical strength due to tidal currents present in the environment. Um, biofilling organisms can be categorized into three main groups. Microfellers, which are, you know, bacteria, diatoms and microalgal biofilms. Uh, soft macrofellers such as sponges and multicellular algae, and hard macrofellers such as barnacles and mussels. Um, I suppose this is important to note that it's the only er early stages of biofilm formation in which you know um, bacteria and diatoms will attach to the submerged 
substrate is what we are concerned of. So, we, you know, the formation of this film will eventually lead to the process of macrofouling. However, if we're looking at um, the first stage, if we actually disrupt this first stage, um, we can prevent later, later organisms from attaching to the surface. Uh, Biofouling is a major problem in marine waters where most immersed surfaces become fouled to some extent, developing you know, large biomass. This problem leads to huge economic losses resulting from decreases ship speeds and constantly larger fuel consumption, general cleaning and maintenance of ships, submarine hulls, marine piping systems, and any surface submerged underwater. And this image is here just to show some of the effects of biofouling on marine monitoring equipment. Historically, um, biosolid coatings containing heavy metals such as copper were used to prevent fouling. However, in the 1970s, the self-polishing copolymer co uh, combined with TVT as the active anti-fouling ingredient was patented. Designed to erode at a continuous rate over the lifetime of the coating. Um, SPCs, when they're combined with TVT, an especially effective anti-fouling surface was created. And these surfaces were actually so effective that new research into anti-fouling technology stalled. However, within a decade of this introduction, evidence began to accumulate linking TBD to ecological and environmental damage, to such an extent that governments and maritime organizations moved to ban the application of TBD coatings, uh, with a total ban occurring in 2008. However, you know, the four decades of market domination by these coatings meant that coating manufacturers had spent little time developing other technologies to TBT. Uh, the new search for marine coatings had meant the opportunity to explore green methods of anti-fouling had arisen, with the consequences that developing non-biocidal methods of preventing fouling received much attention, where natural fouling defense mechanisms have been mimicked through chemical, physical, and stimuli responsible methodologies. And therefore, development of effective and anti-adhesive materials necessitates careful evaluation of biological responses to topography and roughness. So surfaces from natural organisms capable of reducing or preventing growth um, are of interest in materials and engineering sciences. Using, using a natural system for inspiration, termed biomimetics, is regarded as the study and structure of function of biological systems and processes um, for the sustainable design and engineering of materials and machines. Biomimetic surface modification has been considered an anti-failing material development, and studies have examined the anti-failing potential of um, patterns, textures, and roughness scales found in natural organisms. Many marine organisms, uh, as a result of living in the ocean, such as you know, shark, dolphin, whale, have evolved characteristics which prevent the attachment of biofouling organisms on their skin. Uh, some of these examples can be seen in this slide here. Uh, figure one here just shows the comparison of the growth trends looking at five different key research areas from 2009 to, 2000, uh, to 2019, indexed by the Web of Science. Um, so su surprisingly then, uh, the subject area of biomimetic surfaces was among the least researched area of interest during the past 10 years. So this is why bioinspired surfaces. The study of uh, features has become increasingly popular with numerous studies reporting intricate and uh, natural topographies found that are known to resist fouling. The replication of artificial surfaces inspired by nature has, has produced many promising results. Many studies have shown a mixture of attachment depending on the of the organism and the specific microtexture used as a fouling resistant mechanism. However, the explanation behind this attachment is still not very well understood. Uh, a number of models have been proposed over the years to explain this attachment, and a popular mechanism uh, shown in this slide here used to explain the adhesion is attachment point theory. Here, the fouling organism experiences increased attachment where there are multiple attachment points and reduced attachment when the number of attachment points are decreased. This can often be related to microtexture in the sense that highly complex topographies where the microtexture is smaller than that of the organism will not be favorable for attachment. On the other hand, where the microtexture is larger than the organism, its settlement is reported to occur. The Byron's bird surface we have chosen is that of the brailfish. Uh, the brailfish is a small flatfish occurring in the marine waters of the Mediterranean, Norway, and Iceland, um, generally inhabiting sa sandy and muddy coastal waters up to kind of five to 80 meters. It's oval in shape, brownish with light and dark freckles and a creamy underside. So why do we pick the surface then? So we wanted to create a simple surface texture, um, one that is marine inspired and novel that hadn't been studied for its anti feminine capability before, and one that would be relatively easy to replicate. So I suppose in the sense of um, replicating on a large scale for the tidal turbine system. 
uh, the main aim of this texturization then was to disrupt early fouling organisms. So essentially, if you disrupt early fouling organisms, um, such as bacteria and diatoms, then you can prevent the formation of a conditioning layer and prevent future fowlers, such as you know, barnacles and mussels from attachment. With bio-inspired surfaces, uh, the end goal will be to kind of lower the general cleaning, cleaning and maintenance costs, uh, reducing, sorry, reducing the needs for regular cleaning. Uh, the first step of designing any bio-inspired surface is, of course, characterization of the marine organisms, which, which serves as inspiration. So six different dimensions were taken into account. These dimensions were me measured using open source software, image J, and each dimension was assigned a letter, which is shown here in the slide, and average dimensions were calculated from a number of um, electron microscopy images uh, from four different samples and from four different scales. Um, the average standard deviation and standard error were performed, and I suppose the proposed microtextures then were designed um, based on the growth rings of the brill fish found in the marine water. Um, and it was characterized by ranges of individual separated micro ridges of average length of 75 microns and a height of 11 microns, with peak to peak distances between neighboring sections um, 16 and between features 16 microns. The microtexture was designed to replicate the separation micro ridge with several slight modifications, both in terms of measurement and shape. And the cross section was replaced with a rectangular design for mechanical increased mechanical stiffness and replacing the sharp edge of the ridge with a flat surface of 10 micro width. The length was increased to 85 microns to reduce machining requirements. The design constructed in SOLIDWORKS was, was fabricated using the Nanoscribe um, 3D printing system. Uh, the system uses a femtosecond solid state laser, operates wavelength of 780 nanometers. Um, it uses a direct laser writing process whereby polymer structures are formed by deflecting a laser beam into a photosensitive material using alternating X and Y laser scanning directions. Um, the kind of summary of the design microtextures are included here. So distinct feature shapes are included here, sharpened and rounded. Um, and we chose a rounded shape here to kind of mimic the effect of a laser texturing, uh, whereby, stru whereby structures will eventually be scaled up for use on the turbine blade. Um, two test organisms, diatom species, were used on Fora and Nitsia ovalis. Um, they were grown in a bat growth system, uh, filtered in, uh, not in sorry, artificial seawater and supplemented with nutrients with a continuous light cycle. Um, cell numbers were estimated on, using a, a cell counter and to achieve a biomass concentration of 3 million cells per mil for each test. Um, microtextures were immersed in our 10 mil culture suspension for three hours and the colonization then was observed using light microscopy and image J processing software. Statistical analysis performed using Fiji Image J processing software. Um, exposure and saturation levels were adjusted to attain the highest contrast between image elements, and images were cropped at 300 microns. Um, image segmentation was performed using a plugin called Weka Segmentation, um, which is, uses uh, machine learning algorithms to classify red, green, blue, or grayscale image into different classes. Um, two different classes were established here so class one referring to cells. Um, cells in red and class two referring to um, any background of the image. The algorithm was able to handle like a wide variety of image input characteristics and the probability map was transformed to a binary red and black image and the percentage of surface area covered was calculated for each class. Um, it was performed in triplicate with a mean and standard deviation for each of the samples. Some of the results can be here seen here. So, on our glass sample, which is at the bottom of this slide, um, a lot of clustering of cells um, is more common rather than single cell colonies. Um, there's a high density of cells populating the surface and large colonies of cells can also be seen. As there no, there's no microtexture here to break up the colonies into smaller clusters. Um, same with the control here. Um, although the, you know, the surface chemistry of the control has some effect here, you can see large clusters of cells and in great numbers. Looking at the surface microtextures, um, the clustering of cells between uniform gaps of adjacent features appears reduced. Um, if minor cluster clustering of cells does occur, it tends to be at the ends of the features rather than in between adjacent features. And then it was also noted that the size of the organisms actually attaching to the microtextures are smaller than that 
that would be absorbed observed on the glass. Um, on the bottom marker texture here, the rounded with the rounded edges, uh, a lot of more cells can be seen clustering here. And um, it's potentially the rounded features on this marker texture is potentially aiding in the adhesion of cells to providing more contact points for the cells to attach. And this is just a graph of our mean biofilm cover of cells on the surface and mean colony area. So you can see like there's greater, there's a lot more colonies settling on control surfaces in comparison to the microtextures. It's just my acknowledgements. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Roy. Um... We have a, a question for the for Celia for the previous presentation that I missed. Uh, I don't know if Celia, are you there? Can you answer? The question yes. is okay. The question is uh, hello. May may have missed, but were the sample strength tested after saturation in in addition to dry testing? Yes, we, we perform uh, both. We perform the mechanical characterization at um, dry, dry uh, state, let's say, and also after, um, after aging. Alors, not after aging inside the sea, but after aging inside um, a lab, uh, lab oven, uh, let's say, to, to do like a real, uh, real condition. And uh, the, um, the mechanical properties we obtained after and before aging was uh, quite uh, quite similar. No, no big, uh, no big difference. Okay, thank you. There, there are a couple of questions from uh, Patrick Cronin uh, for not for Celia, but by for uh, Chloe. Uh, the first one is how is the level of biofouling per meter from surface? Uh, how sensitive is biofouling to the depth of water column? For me? Um, yeah, Claire, for you. So we calculated four different images per, per microtexture and calculated the percentage coverage of each. So um, there was significant differences then observed between the glass and con control and microtexture samples, um, averaging about 50% you know, coverage for glass samples, 30% for the control, and then around the 16% for the microtextures. Yeah, but uh, I guess that he's uh, asking for uh, the depth to, to those um, at which uh, the, the samples were tested in the water column. They were tested in just uh, one meter depth or two oh, meters? Oh, they were, they, were, they were tested in laboratory assays. So in, in Petri dishes in, um, so we haven't actually tested them in the field yet. That would be the next step. Um, but yeah, no, they were tested in the lab in static, static conditions. Okay, in fact, uh, uh, this, this uh, live testing will be the next step for, for the project, right? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, next one is uh, anti-fouling and cavitation resistance coatings for tidal blades. This is a part of War Package 3, again. Um, the, present, the speakers are uh, my college, uh, Heima Berriozaba from Tecnalia and, and Dulce Muñoz from Funditec. Unfortunately, today is a national holiday here in Spain, so they are not able to, to, to be present on, on, on live, but they have uh, pre-recorded a, a video that uh, uh, we are showing to you. So uh, Janice or Victor, I don't know who is launching this video. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Dulce Muñoz. I am a principal scientist at Funditec, and today I will present the work developed video stops. With, uh, in the, the end to develop antifouling and cavitation resistant coatings for tidal uh, plates. Okay, the general objective of uh, NEMO is uh, to develop models and design and testing procedures in order to develop 
uh, more efficient and uh, more durable composite tidal turbine blades. In addition to the design and the modeling of the blade, uh, uh, of, of the blade, uh, an important role is also the composition of the materials. In this way, we have been working in the blade composite, Canoe and Espenano, and uh, also Technali and Funditec in the development of a uh, blade coating with the objective to increase polymer resistance and also to provide metal like cavitation resistance. We have been working, as you have said, in the Work Package 3 of the NEMO project and the approach that we have followed in order to provide anti fouling uh, resistant uh, coatings is to use on one side biocide functionalized silicon nanoparticles and on the other side to develop novel highly cross-linked uh, polyurethanes and polyurethane uh, dispersions that contain uh, cationic uh, copolymers and when we are going to include uh, particles that provide cavitation and the following uh, resistance. So the first approach and the first step is the synthesis of uh, nanoparticles based on silica and uh, synthesized by the soil gel technology that have uh, biocidal uh, properties. The silica nanoparticles uh, synthesized by Technalia have been uh, fully characterized by TEM and uh, other analytical techniques, and uh, they show both by DLS and TEM uh, average uh, particle size of 85 or 70 nanometers. <coughs> this gives uh, an idea that they are not aggregates and uh, the functionalization of the uh, nanoparticles. Uh, these uh, nanoparticles have been uh, tested against Staphylococcus aureus and uh, it has seen that they provide very good uh, antibacterial activity since uh, most of the bacteria are killed after uh, 24 hours of exposition. The next step is the synthesis of bio, uh, elastomeric polyurethanes and in this case, from the tech, we have followed two strategies. On one side, the synthesis of fluorinated building uh, blocks in the, in the polymer backbone with the idea of decrease the surface energy. Uh, for this, we prepare solvent base two components, fluorinated polyurethanes and in the other type of uh, polymers, designs and synthesized, we include in the polymeric uh, backbone cationic uh, group, uh, ammonium quaternary salts, and we prepare water-based one component cationic polyurethanes. <coughs> For the synthesis of these um, polyurethanes, as I said, we prepare two types of, uh, of compounds. For the two components fluorinated polyurethanes, we uh, synthesized at Funditec component A, that is a fluorinated polysocinate, and in the type 2, an acrylated polysocinate. And these two types of polysocinates are combined uh, with a commercial component B, that is either an acrylic polyol or a fluorinated uh, polyol. This uh, synthesis uh, gave us two types of uh, polymers, the fluorinated and the acrylated uh, polysocinates and uh, we have tested the, after the synthesis the properties of the coatings on the uh, composites provided by Canoe. We see by the properties that uh, they present a good hardness and good adhesion to the composites and the TD is around 23-28 degrees. The other approach, what we uh, develop is, a, in this case, a water-based one component, cationic polyurethane. Okay? For this, uh, we prepare a polyurethane aqueous dispersion, okay? that is, looks like, like this. And uh, we also tested the physical properties uh, when they are applied on the composites provided by Canon. Uh, again, the hardness and adhesion of these uh, materials uh, present uh, good uh, properties. Okay, so the next step is, uh, as I said, to incorporate the nanoparticles synthesized by uh, Technalia into the uh, 
polyurethane matrix prepared by uh, uh, Fungitech. So uh, first, we combine the silica nanoparticles in 1% uh, weight with uh, the component B of the two components coatings or uh, in the case of the water-based uh, polyurethanes directly on the water dispersion. And for the cavitation um, properties, we incorporated carbon nanocomplexes that have been uh, provided by SP Nano and contain the SP1 uh, protein developed with them and different nanoparticles like multi wall carbon nanotubes, single wall carbon nanotubes, graphene, or uh, carbon black. And we added these different uh, types of nanoparticles and nanocomplexes into uh, the 2K uh, polyurethane and the water based uh, dispersions. Okay. So the next step was to apply these uh, dispersions. Coupons prepared by, by Canoe with the composite developed by, by them. Uh, you will see in this slide uh, the comparison also with uh, two commercial top codes that we, uh, that we use for us as a reference. We apply two polyurethane uh, coatings, two components, that is solvent based, coating 3 and coating 15. We added uh, carbon nanoparticles and silica nanoparticles. And we also add these nanoparticles to the polyurethane dispersion, the water base that we call PUV5. Uh, As you see, the, the, the aspect that they show is, is, is good. Okay. These uh, coupons have been uh, tested uh, either for biofouling um, testing in Technalia's Harsh Lab uh, facility and also at Technalia's Pasaya port. And for the cavitation resistance, they have been tested in our facilities at uh, Funditech, uh, following uh, the, the norm and the method of the cavitation erosion test. So from the results obtained at uh, the port of Pasaya, uh, the results of the, of the coupons and the composites with gel coat and one of the polyurethanes with nanoparticles showed that the incorporation of one percentage of uh, silica nanoparticles prepared by Technalia uh, have uh, uh, an impact okay, after 70 days or 100 days in the uh, antifouling uh, performance. We can see that uh, after exposition and after cleaning, uh, there is a, a decrease in the, in the fouling of up to 20% with, uh, when we compare with the uh, control uh, coupon that does not contain any, uh, any nanoparticle inside. For the cavitation erosion test, as I said, uh, we perform uh, the studies in uh, our laboratory, laboratory and uh, from the different um, samples that we tested, including carbon uh, nanoparticles and silica nanoparticles, we can say that uh, there is an improved erosion resistance on the coatings that we have uh, prepared. There is a better adhesion and hardness uh, compared to the commercial ones that are the two at the top of the image. And <clears throat> we also see that coating 15 uh, is more resistant to erosion than coating uh, 13, although both of them are solvent based 2K uh, coatings, polyurethane coatings. We also see that the incorporation of carbon and silica nanoparticles seems not to have any effect on the erosion resistant addition of hardened values. And from the results that we obtained after this testing, we could say that the best of codes uh, seems to be coating 15 and uh, the polyurethane dispersion uh, um, water base 5. So finally, the coatings and the composites that we have prepared are still currently being evaluated for testing uh, aging resistant uh, at uh, Technalia, artificial and natural aging. Also, they are being tested 
uh, against fatigue and impact resistance, Actecta actenalia, and also anti-fouling performance in dynamic conditions and cavitation uh, wear uh, test. As I said, this work has been mainly uh, uh, executed by Technalia uh, and uh, Funditech, and uh, here you have our contacts. So if you have any, any questions, we will be happy to contact or to answer them by, by email. Thank you very much. Okay, well, as you already uh, so I already said, uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can directly write them because uh, it's a pre-recorded video. So there's now possibility of answering the questions uh, uh, live. Uh, next one is also a pre-recording video. Uh, uh, the presenter is uh, Jean-Baptiste Horsin, is, the, is my colleague here at Technalia, and he is leading the World Package 4 about, about uh, testing, accelerated testing. Okay. And here, here he is. Yes, go ahead, Victor. Yeah, Victor, you can. You can Everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jean Baptiste Jossin. I come here and I'm going to uh, present you how to uh, design accelerated algae tests uh, to reproduce the degradation of composite material in seawater. Uh, first of all, before uh, starting anything, I would like to apologize that I'm not going to be with you uh, in person today. And this is a, a registered presentation. You can contact me anyway. If you have any question, you will find my email at the end of the presentation. So let's go uh, on the topic that interests us. So why designing accelerated aging test? Then uh, when we are operating any uh, equipment uh, in operation, uh, the experience shows that uh, degradation of the material uh, that uh, compose this uh, equipment or this asset will degradate with time during the operation. So, and that is due to the interaction with the surrounding environment. So that's due to a uh, degradation of the property of the assets and that may lead to its failure. And the second point is most of the time when this interaction with the surrounding environment in classical uh, environment that we encounter naturally, the kinetic of this degradation is slow, it can take years. So there is necessity to get information from the degradation mechanisms that is uh, occur do, during uh, the uh, exposition of the material in the natural environment and to try or intend to design an artificial aging test that will allow us to get similar degradation mechanism, but in a shorter time. Uh, that's to uh, see how we can test improved material or find a material that will switch better uh, the kind of environment. In the NEMO project that uh, we are uh, focused uh, in this event, uh, the, our asset is a tidal turbine blade, so basically a, a blades that are uh, uh, done uh, to work uh, underwater uh, to uh, generate energy. The material of this blade is a glass fiber reinforced vinyl resin composite with a gel coat uh, surface finishing that is uh, similar. Um, chemical composition. Um, the surrounding environment in this case is uh, seawater and uh, the, the blades are totally immersed. So that is important because uh, in the marine environment, the gradation mechanisms are different depending if uh, we are just exposed to the uh, marine atmosphere. It's, in the area that is 
um, but there is a water splash and, and cycle of, of the rain and um, a, a humid phase and, and dry phase. And there is the immersion where the um, material is con constantly in contact with the seawater. So to, to be able to design our uh, aging accelerated test, um, we'll have to understand a little bit to, to understand a little bit what are the uh, degradation me mechanisms. In our uh, specific case here, we are going just to look at the interaction due to the environment and we are going to leave out of the scope uh, anything related to uh, a, a mechanical loads or a fatigue uh, behavior that is due to the uh, intrinsic, intrinsic uh, operation of the of the asset that is covered by a other partner in the project as well as we are going to limit our uh, in interaction with uh, biofueling that is completely covered by other partner. In this case, it's really the interaction with the seawater, uh, uh, between the seawater and our material that interests. And obviously we'll have to take account of the fooling and biofueling, but it's not going to be a, a deep study on, on that. So uh, there is a complex interaction between the seawater and, and our uh, components. And the main degradation mechanism that we can expect and they are uh, recorded in the literature are the water absorption that leads to a plasticization of uh, the, the material with a diminution of the glass temperature transition and a lot of mechanical properties. They can be also due to this water absorption, a swelling of the matrix of the, uh, the polymeric matrix that can uh, leads to the formation of interfacial cracks at the um, uh, interface between the resin and the fibers. And uh, we can have also fiber matrix debonding. Mechanical loads. Uh, <laughs> If the material is under mechanical load, we could have a, an enhancement of the a, a penetration of the of moisture, and that would just increase our kinetic of, of let's say, water uh, absorption. And then there will be uh, the interaction uh, due to uh, the growth of uh, biofooling and uh, uh, the fooling may affect or due to the uh, proper metabolism of the micro and microorganisms uh, that develop at the surface of the material and they, uh, they can uh, metabolize or produce uh, uh, molecules and, and elements that, that can affect our material or just due to their presence they will affect the uh, condition of the surrounding environment and create uh, things such as a, a gradient of concentration of element, like gradient of concentration of oxygen or um, chloride concentration or these kind of things that may also affect our uh, material. So it's very complex. Now, the way uh, uh, to do it uh, uh, a, a bit more uh, straightforward is to intend to compare a natural aging and an accelerated aging test that uh, we think it could be suitable for the solution. In the case of the natural aging, uh, in Technalia, we have the luck to be, and, and we work for it also quite a lot, to have access to a different, a, a two different locations that are related with a marine, marine and and see water environments that are uh, the port of Pasaya where we can expose samples. This is a port closed environment and it has the specific specificity to be uh, uh, with high flowing development. And then we have another facility that is really an offshore facility uh, and it's called Harsh Lab. There is a little 
image on the side, but I'm, I'm going to, to come more in details about that. Um, the idea is to prepare sample of our composite material and to put it in uh, immersion in these two locations for at least 10 months. So a little bit more about the uh, exposition facilities. Uh, we have uh, this port of Pasaya, that is uh, an area uh, in the north of Spain, near uh, San Sebastian, where we uh, can uh, install samples, as you can see, on this on this picture is a portable environment quite close where there is like a mix of a, a, a clear water coming from a river here and the sea coming uh, in the channel here so here we have quite a, a, a static condition with a mix of the uh, and, and, and clear water mainly mainly salty and we have here a, a port, so there is also a lot of contaminant that uh, lead to a fast growth of a, a biofueling and in particular barnacles in this area. The second facility is the Harsh Lab, that is a buoy that is um, moored in an area close to Bilbao in the north of Spain. And on this buoy, we can expose samples of in the atmospheric uh, area, in the splash zone, and in the immersion zone. And this is the area that interests us. And we have a system of mobile racks that allow us to put the samples in immersion uh, while operating on the on the on the buoy, as you can see on the, on the image here. Uh, so we can have an easy access to the immersed samples without having to use divers. Um, so the idea is to install our samples in, in this area here. And then, uh, now I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the accelerated agenda test. Uh, to, uh, as a starting point, uh, we have to consider two things. First, we need, we would like to have a high lifetime uh, for materials, so they are supposed to you to operate for at least 25 years. So material tends to be uh, uh, quite strong, and uh, the needs of an accelerated aging test is important, and it should be as relevant as possible. Uh, for a polymeric coatings, anti-corrosion coating, actually, there is a very well-known standard that is the ISO 12944, that is uh, uh, in, in, in operation. And uh, there is quite a lot of simili simili similarities between um, our composite material and this polymeric uh, anti-corrosion coatings. So that could be a good starting point, but it had to be uh, adapted as the coating are supposed to be uh, used in the splash and atmosphere, atmospheric area. And we are uh, looking for a uh, immersed uh, um, condition. So uh, the idea is to uh, take um, the aging cycle that is proposed and to uh, adapt it for uh, uh, immersion. So basically, uh, the, for the coatings, the cycle is made of a 48 hours of condensation combined with a UV exposition, a salt spray test for four days, and a thermal shock uh, the uh, last day. And our adaptation consists in switching the salt spray test by an immersion test at a, a, a slightly elevated temperature. So our uh, proposed aging cycle is consisting in 24 hours of exposition to a UV condensation a condition uh, uh, at 50 degrees with a 12 hour of UV at a 314 nanometer and 068 weight per square meter, 
uh, and 12 hour off. So with the condensation continuously going at with a temperature at 50 degree, so the water can evaporate. And with the decrease of the gradient of temperature, when it, it condensate, when it reach the the samples, then it would be four days from day three to day six of immersion in sea water at 40 degrees. That is higher than uh, the average temperature of the sea water. That is what we want because due to a uh, renew slow, all the kinetics should be accelerated when uh, the temperature is elevated. Nevertheless, it shouldn't be elevated too high because it may affect the, the, the material. So 40 degrees seems to be a good compromise. And then a thermal shock to generate stress in the samples. Uh, here we have uh, the equipment we use for this uh, aging accelerated cycle that are uh, uh, our UV condensation chambers, our immersion uh, um, uh, system where we can have recirculation of water, so we, do, we keep the oxygen const the concentration constant, and we have a thermoregulator in, in this area, so we can control also the temperature. And then we have here our climatic chamber when we can perform a thermal shock. The second point is uh, how do we assess the damage that will occur on our material, say, uh, there is one point that is uh, performing the aging of the material, and the other point is to be assessed the damage that results from this aging. Uh, we plan to do a uh, five different kinds of, of characterization. The first one is a gravimetric characterization, basically measuring a difference of mass before and after aging, uh, and we'll need for that a precision scale. Then we plan to do differential scanning. A calorimetry, the SC. Uh, so in this case, we take we take a little bit of age samples, and then we perform a, a temperature run from minus 90 to 250 degrees at 20 degrees per minute, and we look how the the heat is absorbed or released by the samples. And the point here, we have a special interest in determining determining the uh, glass temperature transition. Then we plan to perform a, a um, FTIR, a fast Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, in order to check if there is any a modification in the chemistry of the material. So a, a infrared spectroscopy allows us to check how the uh, some of the um, a link between molecules are, are affected between molecules and elements. And for that, we take a little bit of the samples that we mix with a KBR, a, a potassium bromide, a, a, to prepare pellets. And these pellets are placed in the uh, spectrometers to uh, take out the, the ER spectrum. And then we plan to do a mechanical test, in this case, tensile test, to check if there is any modification the mechanical property due to the uh, water uptake in the materials or uh, uh, degradation due to UV uh, uh, that may uh, uh, break some links and, and leads in a possible loss of mechanical properties. And finally, we use uh, extensively um, optical characterization through a normal camera and a binocular that uh, allows to, to magnify and do neat pictures. Let's see a little bit how, how our material behaves in the natural aging. So we can see here what happened in Harsh Lab. Uh, basically, from the initial to three months, seven months, uh, uh, of, of exposition and then 10 months is very similar. Uh, basically, the samples is going covered by fooling. That is the main thing that we can see. Uh, in Pasaya, uh, uh, we can see more or less the same behavior with, with the covering of fooling, except that the fooling looks very different. In the case of Harsh Lab, we have algae and mussels 
and uh, little crabs and worms, etc. Uh, I'm mainly covered with barnacles. We can we don't see any green things uh, uh, at all. So, algae, green algae, so all these kind of things we don't see, and we don't see either uh, mussels or similar things. Then. Uh, with this growth of fooling, a, a problem uh, that is quite important is how we can clean the samples. In some, in some cases, it's really necessary, especially for the um, granulomatic test. We would like to see the effect of the water uh, absorption. But uh, if there is a lot of fooling and we cannot remove it properly, that is uh, mainly the case. We'll have problem with that. Uh, the problem of removing the the uh, the problem of, of, of removing the the the, the biofooling remaining is quite critical and it's not completely solved because uh, um, using mechanical uh, removing may degrade our samples and there is no simple way to do it. So that's really a challenge that it's not completely solved. Uh, you can see here that the, the, the uh, barnacles mainly are not penetrating the material but are really mainly stick on the superficie and this addition is very very strong. Uh, when we try to to uh, remove it mechanically, it breaks, but doesn't. It, there is always the piece remaining, and uh, with water jet, we damage the coating of, of the of the uh, gel coat, uh, and that is quite it's quite a big problem. And we can see clearly that on the gravity measurements, where we can observe a, a, a strong dependence of the results in Passaia and uh, harsh lab due to uh, uh, this effect of the of the remainings of the the biofoolings, mainly in Passaia because it's mainly barnacles and the barnacles are the most difficult to remove. And we, when we look a little bit what happened in the labs, we can see a slight tendency of of water uptakes, but there is also there and not a, that clear tendency. So uh, uh, water doesn't penetrates much in, in, in the samples in during the time of dredging cycle cycles that's why it's a perform four four months. Look a little bit what, what happened with the infrared spectroscopy. Uh, we can identify various um, um, groups of, of determination that are the uh, OH, the CH and the ester group. And we can see that there is no major modification in the uh, different uh, samples that were added in different areas. And we can see also that the spectra is very similar to uh, pre-registered spectra in the database of the uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy treatment software. That is the polyester with insaturated isophthalat. That is very close actually to the chemistry of the gel code. So what we see is that the material doesn't degrade it uh, in the chemical point of view, in the chemistry. So um, there is basically, we could conclude that there is very poor or no effect of the UV on the degradation of the material because the main source of chemical degradation in this case. Look a little bit at the result of the DSC. We just saw that uh, we had a hard time to get a good DSC measurements and we couldn't exploit them properly to get extra uh, um, glass temperature transition. So uh, we couldn't really consider this uh, technique to characterize properly our samples. And finally, we we got the results from the stand size test. And here also we cannot see much difference between the three type of aging, uh, uh, aging in in uh, aging in in 
Passaya port in the harsh lab and uh, artificial gene. And also these variations are not that different to the reference material without adding. So uh, it's hard uh, to, 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 to get a conclusion. Maybe there could be a slight uh, effect of what happened in the harsh lab, but it's, it's a little bit difficult to take a clear conclusion from, from, from this result at the uh, uh, confidence interval are overlapping, uh, overlapping in, in all the cases. Well, what, what we can get from that? Uh, the triaging did not affect the infrared and the assist spectral. See, low effect of, there is clearly a low effect of the uh, UV on the degradation mechanisms. That also makes sense because the blades are several meters under water in the operation condition, and most probably most of the UV are stopped by the uh, sea water. Uh, the triaging did not lead different uh, in significant difference between the uh, mechanical in the mechanical property, and we could then conclude in the uh, uh, plastization due to water uptake. And the gravity show that mainly uh, in Pasayan Harshab it was completely oriented by the um, presence of bio remaining of biofueling that was really hard to clean. So the, these measurements are biased. And in the laboratory, in the artificial aging test, we can see a slight uptake, but it's quite less than, was, was, than what was expected. So to conclude, we can see that this material that was initially, initially chosen uh, for uh, the blade construction was quite uh, well chosen, is quite well suitable for this environment. We cannot see a clear degradation during the aging that we perform. Uh, we could see in by comparing what happened in the aging uh, in natural and uh, natural environment and in the accelerated test that there is no effect of the UV, so that can be removed from the, the aging cycle and put more time in immersion in the water. So from this procedure, we could propose a new artificial aging procedure that is uh, made of a six day of immersion in seawater at 30 degrees and one uh, thermal shock at uh, uh, minus 20 to generate stress inside the sample. And what is the next step with that? Uh, then in the, in the NEMO project, a new enhanced material were developed for the uh, substrate, so the composite material, and coatings to uh, be applied on top of the gel coat, mainly with anti fooling properties. So it's going to be really interesting to test these new materials. And they are going, the, these tests are actually ongoing. We have uh, enhanced materials, the same reference material to keep uh, track with uh, something that we know. And some of the samples coated or not with uh, a, a new anti fooling coatings. And that's going to be really interesting to see, uh, to see if we can get rid more CV of the fooling to get more data on the uh, degradation property of the material. And also on uh, how the modification that were applied on the, on the bare on the composite material will affect the, the edge. So I thank you very much all for listening to me. And if you have any question. Okay, <clears throat> so sorry for this long video. It's maybe too long for, for the time slot uh, he had. Uh, well, uh, as, as uh, he said, if you have uh, any question related to this uh, testing procedures, just uh, send an email to, to Jean Baptiste. And in this case, so uh, this is the last presentation um, for our site. Uh, I don't know if Amy, you want to make the, the closure of the of the webinar.